kind of a challenge I would have to anybody who watches the Is Genesis History movie. When one side presents their argument, it sounds compelling mm -hmm. until somebody comes and cross-examines them. Next up in the Is Genesis History Parade of PhDs was Steve Boyd, a Hebraist, who was there to speak to the linguistic clues in the early chapters of Genesis. As tends to be, the central debate is the meaning of Yom, translated as day in most English Bibles, and its meaning. Unsurprisingly, Boyd feels this can be interpreted in no manner other than 24 hours, despite legions of scholars who disagree, or are at least less certain. But as nothing Boyd discusses was a scientific claim, and this is Is Genesis History Science, Let's skip ahead to the next on the roster. Dr. Andrew Snelling of Sydney, Australia, currently in the employ of Answers in Genesis, representing the field of geology. Andrew took Dell to SP Crater, a cinder cone volcano near Flagstaff, Arizona. As visually impressive as the crater is, Andrew pointed out that this is a relatively small volcano in historical context. He speaks of Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980, which was 2,500 times smaller than the Yellowstone eruption, estimated to be 630,000 years ago, by the way, which in turn was a fraction of the size of the largest known volcanic eruption of the Deccan Traps in India, about 65 million years ago. Using these three data points, Snelling concludes, What we see in the present is really only uh, a minuscule by comparison mm. to what we've seen in the past. There are currently around 1,500 of what are considered to be active volcanoes in the world, with about 50 or so erupting each year. Even if we limit ourselves to 6,000 years of history, that's 300,000 eruptions to consider. And Andrew cherry-picked three examples to infer a trend that volcanic activity is not only trending downward, but that it is reducing by orders of magnitude. In fact, the trend lines over time for volcanic activity are relatively flat and stable, even over relatively short periods of time. What we do see are spikes in frequency and spikes in severity, just as one would expect in a relatively random event like volcanoes. Small eruptions happen all the time. Big eruptions happen all the time. And that's telling us something about the historic past. We can't use present day rates of these processes to understand mm -hmm. how quickly and how majestically in terms of scale the geological record accumulated. Andrew is inferring that somehow because volcanic activity isn't consistent enough to be considered a clock, that somehow no clock could possibly exist. This is like saying that because the amount of rainfall varies from year to year, that we have no way of knowing how long it takes the Earth to orbit the Sun. Because some days I drink more coffee than other days, no one can predict when the 6 o'clock news will be on. Demonstrating an unpredictable event in no way rules out predictable events. Some things happen at constant rates, some things happen at variable rates. Actually, Andrew would disagree with that, but we'll get to that in a minute. Finally, Dell asks the big question. How do we determine the age of these rocks? To my surprise, Andrew answers with the high-level, but relatively accurate description of radiometric dating. Radioactive elements in volcanic rock begin to decay to daughter products, and by using the slow rate of this conversion, rocks can be dated to millions of years old. The fact that the decay rates in the present are slow. In the present? That's strange phrasing. But we would say that the present uh, is not really the key to the past because obviously the past holds some massive, massive catastrophic events right. that are not going on today. Wait, what? What catastrophe could possibly affect the rate that radioactive elements decay? Those rates have been rigorously tested to be unaffected by temperature, pressure, moisture, electrical or magnetic fields, or any other external pressures. For the sake of being complete, a relatively rare process of electron capture can affect the rate, but by less than 1%. Decay rates are literally clockwork. The one major catastrophe a young Earth creationist proposes is a worldwide flood. But what aspect of a year-long flood could possibly impact decay rates? Again, the most extreme temperature, pressure, and moisture conditions have absolutely no impact on radioactive decay. But rather than merely asserting it, let's look at studies like this one of rocks from the Moon, Mars, and meteorite material that hits Earth show that radioactive decay rates are identical on those bodies as they are on Earth. Are we to believe that the catastrophic events of Noah's flood equally impacted bodies in outer space? In fact, Andrew himself wrote an extensive paper on one of these meteorite finds and concluded, there is no doubt that the decay rates in space were consistent with the decay rates on Earth. He even says the 4.56 billion year old age is well established, but I think that would be an unfair quote mine. So what are these alleged catastrophes that change the laws of physics? We never find out. Okay, the Bible would say that the past is the key to the present. Mm -hmm. If you under want to understand why the way the world is today, you've yeah. got to understand what happened yep. in the past. Yep. Now, I know I said earlier that our series is focused solely on the movie's science claims and not the theological ones, 
But given this claim, I'd be remiss to not point out that there's a list of verses, including Jeremiah 33.25, where God says he fixed the laws for the sky and earth, that most theologians point to as biblical evidence that the laws of nature have never changed. So we've got lots of hints that geological processes haven't been at constant rates through time, and we have other hints that the decay rates may not have been constant. Hints is an interesting choice of words. Hints that decay rates may not have been constant is quite different from evidence that they were different. But if hints are all we have, what are these hints? Variation in the rates of volcanoes exploding was inexplicably talked about, but never connected to decay rates. I took to Andrew's scholarship to find out more about these hints. But all I could find was this 2009 article with a single example of a single sample where two radiometric methods came up with radically different dates. It sounded like he had more lines of evidence, but since not... What we've done is we've submitted the same samples to more than one of these dating methods. And so what we found is on the same samples with more than one method, we were getting ages that were different by hundreds of millions of years mm. and even, even a billion years in some instances. I looked up Andrew's paper on this experiment. And by paper, I mean a relatively short article on the ICR website. It's basically a retelling of Stephen A. Austin's 1992 article. You'll remember Austin from our introductory episode as the one who deliberately used dating equipment known to be imprecise to try to prove imprecision. I wonder if we'll do something like that again. Now, Austin's article compares the rubidium strontium dating of some Grand Canyon samples with what's called the isochron dating method for the same samples. Now, isochron dating is unique among radiometric dating techniques in that it requires measurements to be taken from several different objects, and those objects must have all formed at the same time from a common pool of materials. Interestingly, in 1988, four years before the study in question, Austin published this article, which demonstrated that he was aware that the lava flows from which he eventually took his samples fell into two different stratigraphic changes, and as such, were not from the common pool of material nor formed at the same time. His 1988 article even describes this false isochron effect in relation to others Grand Canyon samples, so he was well aware of it. Now, if radiometric dating methods are so inaccurate, why deliberately select such samples? We're seeing huge differences by using different, different methods. It is the undeniable convergence of common answers from properly applied dating methods that has us convinced that these things are reliable. Well, if, if there is that kind of a difference between all of these dating method, methods, then that would seem to confirm the fact that we have an open system here, not Correct. a closed one. And if we have an open system, that means we can't trust it yeah. uh, to give us dependable dates. For clarification, when Andrew talks about an open system in this context, he means that parent or daughter isotopes could potentially have been added or removed from the sample. In a closed system, like a laboratory, we'd be very sure that there were no contamination or loss. Of course, this is no gotcha, and not news to those who perform radiometric dating procedures. Geochronologists know that there are no closed systems outside of a laboratory, and they take great pains to minimize the dangers of contamination, with procedures improving over time. Best results come when multiple samples are used, when well-known contamination markers are absent, and when multiple methods provide tight convergence. Ironically, it is complete disregard for these procedures that we explored in the introductory episode of Is Genesis History Science, and what Andrew is repeating here. And that changes the whole thinking about the history of the Earth. Having gone on the record asserting the radiometric decay rates were different in the past without offering any mechanism for this, evidence for it, not even a Bible verse to support the idea, Andrew takes Del south of Sedona for what he promises is evidence of a young Earth transformed by a global catastrophe. For several minutes, the film showcases the views, while the men speak in hushed, majestic tones about the size and scales meant to put the viewer in awe. As they probably should be. It's amazing. It's almost hard to imagine the volume of material that that represents. Of course, scale says nothing about the process, so let's just enjoy the view. It's like a stack of pancakes. Mmm, pancakes. Andrew points out what he calls the knife edge boundary, the seemingly seamless edges between layers, which isn't actually a consistent thing with well-known crumbling and upheaval in many parts. But I've never really even been sure why this should be a convincing argument. If you've ever made a parfait, you know that the most recently added layer will fill in seamlessly over the layer below, no matter how irregular. And a side view will always look perfectly fitted, regardless of slopes and angles and volume. There's no evidence of erosion there, which means that the hermit formation was rapidly deposited, and then immediately the coconino was a deposit on top of it. Why would it have to be immediate? In our parfait example, one could add the next layer immediately, or hours, or days, or weeks later. It's the exact same effect. The top layer is fresh and fills in the cracks of what's below. 
The film then grinds to an oddly specific halt to talk about one of the Grand Canyon layers, known as a Coconino sandstone, and the comparative angle of cross bedding effect on land or underwater. Cross bedding creates the diagonal lines we see, but why are we talking about this? According to Andrew's own ICR website, standard thinking cites the Coconino sandstone as perhaps the most difficult formation to reconcile with the flood model of Earth history. The conventional view is that the Coconino sandstone represents ancient windblown desert sand dunes, which would have been impossible to form during the global flood. And Dr. John Whitmore has uh, combed the hills around here with his students, hundreds and hundreds of measurements of these cross beds, and they all come in the range of 15 to 25 degrees. Mm. So it was underwater deposition. Naturally, I looked for Dr. Whitmore's study. It turns out the results were never put into a paper, but were presented once at a conference. His team took 216 measurements. Is that hundreds and hundreds? A table of the measurements has not been shared, but Whitmore claims a mean of 20 degrees, but admits a range as high as 32 degrees. So at very least, Andrew is lying that they all came in under 25 degrees. Why is that important? The angle ranges for land and water indicate the maximum angles for such dunes to exist before collapsing upon themselves. Of course, some dunes will collapse sooner and therefore have a lower angle. The presence of even one reaching 32 degrees, as admitted by Whitmore, indicates that they had to be on dry land as that's well above the maximum ever found underwater. Of course, the literal textbook on this subject and the U.S. Forest Service claim most of the Coconino cross bedding is steep. We don't even have Whitmore's details to compare the claims. Unfortunate. But the evidence of dry land formation isn't limited to those angle measurements. There's material type and distribution, the unique land-based ripple marks, and, most damagingly, an abundance of clear and distinct fine sand reptilian tracks. Yep, reptile footprints. Since the Coconino layer is relatively high up, under flood geology, it would have to have been formed later in the event. There could have been no land-based reptiles alive to be walking around, underwater, leaving very crisp footprints. Strange that Andrew didn't mention that. So it isn't a difference in believing in those layers that exist. Not it's, at all. It's, it's the difference of time, isn't it? Nope. The difference is starting with the conclusion. Once people get locked into that focus, anything outside their field of view that conflicts with that focus uh, is, is marginalized. To be intellectually honest, one must look at all the evidence. But you were saying that this kind of evidence uh, is in the open literature now. Yes, yes. Well, that's right. It's not that these vague science claims you make are new to anyone. They're not being dismissed. Everyone knows about them. It's not like these claims were made by Andrew or his team. Some of them are centuries old. Why is it not making an impact? Because they've been weighed and considered in light of all the evidence. Cherry-picking a few stray data points and speaking to lay people about them in misleading terms is unlikely to impact those who study these things for a living. Is Genesis History Science? continues with part 4 hosted by Strike on his channel. Tap on the video image to continue there now, or find a link in the description. Before you go, why not subscribe to Apologia to make sure you're notified of future episodes. Later!